but it's even more special to love, especially to love our Lord. And then I'll just turn this on. That can be enough. Don't want to keep you guys in the dark. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, it feels good to have Deborah standing up here with me again. Yeah. Amen. It feels good to be standing up. <laughs> if you ask my opinion, the Lord took his time healing her, but that's all right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before I forget, um, the Man Clan, if you've never heard them, they're just an incredible Christian, bluegrass, songwriters, singers, group, ministry, um, many, many things, and they, they travel um, hosting revivals at churches, and they'll be at Heritage Church tonight in Arcata at 6 p.m. tonight, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it'll be 7 o'clock every night. If you get a chance, you don't want to miss it. They are wonderful and powerful, and this may sound weird, but just their appearance refreshes your soul, because you look at this family and see a family that has been set apart for God. All their lives set apart for God. So uh, if, you, if you can, attend, participate, and you'll be blessed. So my question this morning is, where is the voice of reason? The voice of reason. As you know, last Saturday, I was making trips to the hospital. Saturday night, I was still struggling with finding my conclusion for our message last week, never a dull moment in the kingdom. And it's my personal conviction to always, always, always bring a fresh word over the pulpit. And I'm old, so I may repeat myself or tell the same stories, repeat my favorite stories, but I find great fulfillment in hearing what God wants us to know now, today for us who are here among, or I guess as Psalm 27 says, in the land of the living. And I have topics that I can't seem to get away from. I have a hard time not mentioning social media. It's something I tend to be repetitive about. And that's not likely to end anytime soon unless God says, that's enough for me. <laughs> The way people communicate interpersonally has been impacted by social media in a huge way. There's a phenomenon where people say things they would never normally say to someone's face because they feel like they're anonymous somehow because they're just typing words. Same thing with texting. It can be so misinterpreted. The phrase, the voice of reason, that applies to when a person who speaks, a person who speaks for the rational, when people are behaving irrationally, the voice of reason comes in. I used to call it, you know, when Paul and I were first married, I called it the spirit of wet blanket, because he was ready to go and conquer the world, and I'd say, wait a minute now, is that what we're called to do? But the voice of reason the voice of reason, when governed and engineered by God is such a good thing. And God in his grace promises to give us wisdom. In fact, he's generous with wisdom when we just ask. So I don't know why we don't tap into it more often. And when I say we, I mean me. I mean all of us. In James chapter 1 verse time, Verse 5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That and without reproach, that's an amazing thing. We can ask any question, and he won't give us reproach. He will give us an answer. He will always be our voice of reason. From now until forever, we need 
only ask. According to James 1.5, all we need to do is ask. So Father, again today I come before you standing in need of your wisdom, always, always in need of your wisdom as we try to navigate these end times, these days, in your kingdom, in this world, the kingdoms in this world that try to prevail against your kingdom, God. We're right in the midst of it. And you have equipped us, Lord, to address the things that are happening today, just as you equipped the early church. So we are listening, Father, and asking in Jesus' name for the wisdom that only you can give. Amen. 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 As I began seeking God for direction this week, I felt we weren't finished with the topic of the kingdom of heaven. Um, I, I don't think we'll ever be finished with it in a sense. I was taking notes. I was sitting in the Walmart parking lot. I dropped Pastor Paul off at the Ministerial Association meeting that happens once a month on the second Tuesday. And I went to Walmart to get medications, take care of business. And the Lord began speaking to me about the kingdom of heaven. And, and so I was taking notes to write them down because I'll forget. I'll forget. I'm old. I forget stuff. <laughs> and if I don't write it down, it's gone. Um, so as it happens, when I left Walmart and went back to the association meeting, the breakfast there, um, the speaker, lo and behold, his topic was the kingdom of heaven. Right away, God was confirming in me, i got something to say to you about this. Pay attention. The speaker was Brother Larry Seymour from Manila Community Church of God. He's a good friend. He's a good friend of Paul. He does a wonderful, spirit-filled ministry over there on the peninsula. And he began by saying, we preach the message of Jesus. But do we preach the message that Jesus preached? Now think about that. We preach Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do we preach the message that Jesus preached? Okay. Boy, that got my attention. Jesus preached the message of repentance and the kingdom of God. Right after the temptation in the desert, he began his ministry, and scripture says in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're told in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We are to preach the kingdom. And we are to seek the kingdom. How? How is that done? And I say it's by listening to that voice of reason. The word of God. The wisdom of God. That surpasses, supersedes the wisdom of this world. Just as it was in that day. The kingdom is here. Jesus himself said, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is near. And when Jesus comes again, the kingdom will be restored to its fullness. Jesus, the kingdom of God who is here, who is near, and with whom we will reign in that kingdom forever. I know I'm being repetitive. I, I think God is wanting us to get a greater hold on the concept of the kingdom of God. I forget, my glasses tap against the mic. Oh, I wondered what that was. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, someday, when we hear the voice of Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful ser servant. Enter thou into your rest. We will be entering the kingdom, our eternal home, the fullness of the kingdom of God. Brother Seymour pointed out that when Jesus sent the disciples out, he told them four things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and preach the kingdom. Preach the kingdom. We can't preach the kingdom if we don't understand or have a kingdom perspective. 
And when you think about it, every parable Jesus taught was about the kingdom of God and the way things work. Many even began with a directive. This is how it worked in the kingdom of God. If our conversations don't come from a place of righteousness, which we're told is the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, we aren't preaching the kingdom of heaven. We're preaching the kingdom of us, kingdom of me, and of this world. We have to listen to the only true voice of reason, the only true voice of righteousness, the voice that speaks peace, the voice that brings joy. In Romans 8, 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, where does that come in? We started to study Romans 8 in our Thursday night study. We're going to continue that. Nick's going to be bringing the devotion next Thursday. I'm bringing up the law because it seems like our laws, even those unwritten laws that govern us, are no longer based on biblical standards. They're selfish. They're politically motivated. And we are right at the same political threshold as the disciples were, as the early church was. The law that was meant to set us free now enslaves us. The disciples were disappointed when things didn't happen the way they expected, yet when he rose from the dead, they preached Jesus, they preached the gospel, they preached the kingdom of God, present and future. They didn't know whether it's going to be two days or 200 years. We don't know. But boy, we can see the signs. And it doesn't seem to matter what is said. It seems to matter to the world. Who says it? One day everyone's listening to you, and the next they're prepared to publicly destroy you. And no longer do we say, God said it, I believe it. That's a, that's a churchy phrase. We look for the consensus that social media provides. What I often refer to as the cyber tower of Babel. Did a paper in Bible college about that. Instead of building the bricks to reach God, we built an internet and thought we could reach the mind of God and become God in the process. The cyber tower of Babel. Our gospel is not a copy and paste message. It's alive and it brings hope to those who are weary. And I'm devastated. I'm discouraged by the way even believers speak about one another and to one another, by the way they speak profanity and use humor that's based in depravity. By the way, they criticize and bite and accuse. You think it was just Someone who does not know, that may be joy. Thank you, Nick. One of these days, we're going to replace that handle. A door. Well, the whole door, but yeah, it'll be a while. Amen. Amen. Come on in. Thank you, Lord. We are part of the remnant that walks in love and remembers, good morning, the voice of God. Do I? My eyes are deceiving me. <laughs> no. Oh my goodness. You're going to give Pastor Paul a heart attack when he comes back. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Lord. You are part of the remnant that walks in love and remembers the voice of God. You got me back for what Pastor Paul did at your wedding. <laughs> he made everybody cry. For years, each political party has accused the opposing party of wanting to get rid of Social Security. They make that threat constantly. They're going to raise your taxes. They're going to do away. They're going to take away your Social Security. And it happens every election year. They make those, both sides, make those accusations. Meanwhile, I looked at Pastor Paul the other morning and I said, while well, we're still being taxed, and if either party doesn't quit spending money, 
that doesn't exist, we're going to be losing much more than Social Security. We're going to be losing everything. And in the kingdom of God, the economy is fair and perfect. We help one another with everything we have. In Isaiah 55, Verse 1, it says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. There's a whole message in that one. In God's economy, everything is rich and free. Nick, just check. Thank you. Even eternal life. There is a place of perfect provision in Jesus. The credit check has already been done. Already been approved. The down payment has already been made. Jesus paid the price. In John 14, 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Each political opponent declares themselves as the one that really, really cares about you. They capitalize. They exploit every human tragedy that's happening on earth. Every injustice that they can lay hold of. And yet, the true injustice is that Jesus had to pay the price for us. You okay? Okay. Thank you. Each candidate makes promises that they can't keep. They don't have the power. They don't have the ability. At this point, they can't keep these promises. They can't fix it. And I don't care who is speaking. If it's true, it's true. If it's a lie, it's a lie. I've said that several times this week. I said that to my family. I don't think they liked it. I guess, like Joseph and his brothers, they don't expect the youngest daughter to preach at them. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes the voice of reason tells us very basic things, like stop saying that, don't say that, don't go there. But sometimes it's more profound, like get your house in order, or repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Every direction we receive from God is equally important because God orders our steps when we're living righteously and we're living according to the kingdom perspective. And just to catch you up, AJ and Mrs. AJ, we're, we're asking the question, where's the voice of reason? And I heard a, a friend speak that we preach Jesus but do we preach the message that Jesus preached? I want to see his face. <laughs> Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> Going to take you a minute. <laughs> I, I'm getting here. <laughs> Somebody else is over there, Pastor Paul. I yes. see. <laughs> Do you know who it is? AJ. <laughs> hey. They snuck in on you. <laughs> you missed out. We baptized oh, AJ <laughs> when he was a little guy. Good to see you too. And his parents. And you too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus. God's full of surprises. Every direction we receive from God is equally important because God orders our steps when we're living with a kingdom perspective. When Pastor Paul proposed, I jumped on board the ministry train without hesitation, even if it was only two days after our first day. I posted on Facebook on Tuesday that it was, Tuesday was the 30th anniversary of our first date, and the pastor, who was my pastor at that time, commented, he was shocked that 30 years had gone by, and I told him, you did a good job pronouncing us as man and wife, and his response was, you and Paul have made me very happy 
that I had a small part in starting the two of you on the road to a fruitful ministry as husband and wife. Wow. What a sweet thing. See, the kingdom of God has much more than a small part in our lives. It's the reason for everything we do, for every decision we make. Facebook is a tool, an evangelistic tool. Don't forget that. It's not an opportunity to point to ourselves. It's an opportunity to point to who Jesus is. When we stood and took vows and to see grandbaby pictures, is that too? <laughs> When we stood and took vows at the altar, we specifically committed our lives to the work of the kingdom, and we proceeded to lead men and women to the path of repentance. We need to imitate Christ and preach the kingdom, not imitate old religious rhetoric and mimic what the world is saying, and don't try to fit into the mold of this generation what social media says or whatever political party you affiliate with says. The voice of reason refers to the person who speaks for the rational, the prudent action among people who are behaving irrationally. Jesus is the rational. He is the rational. People are behaving irrationally, defunding police, throwing money at situations that money can't fix, letting dangerous criminals out of jail, refusing to prosecute thieves and shoplifters and even murderers. Meanwhile, families can't afford to live and are accruing credit card debt like no other time in history. There comes a day when debt needs to be paid, and yet we still don't understand that Jesus paid ours. In Deuteronomy 15.6, it says, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. A blessing available to any nation who knows God as their God. We disregarded those blessings and even the protection that we can have. And it feels today like those things are in jeopardy, even up until this very moment with what's been happening in Israel. It is our prayers, the prayers of the saints, I believe, that has kept us thus far. In Proverbs 22, 7, it says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. I've heard... I, a friend of mine said, you know, uh, China owns the Redwoods. Well, I don't know if they do, but I know that our country owes China $859.4 billion. That's not scriptural, guys. That's not the wisdom, the voice of reason. In Romans 13, 8, it says, Owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Our laws, our economy, our system of justice are no longer based on the biblical standard and our society no longer adheres to the Judeo-Christian ethic or the Christian world view. And I'm almost done, but I'm gonna kind of rattle off some scriptures. One is Romans 2. Verses 14 and 15, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness in their thoughts, alternately accusing or else defending them. Sounds like the Wild West. Let's return to the voice of reason. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, and so every sin. The ESV says, which clings so closely, and King James says, which so easily besets us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus 
looking to Jesus. It doesn't say looking to Facebook or X or Twitter, whatever those are. <laughs> it says looking to Jesus. We know that, but do our kids know that? Do our children know that? Do our grandchildren realize that? Our nation and our world is being shaken. I made a decision to, it's gone, tell you a story about the two people you saw whose pictures you saw. One was Christy, one was Craig. Craig um, and Christy were the first people who came to our ministry in Lake County, who gave their hearts to the Lord. And I told Pastor Paul this morning, you know, we often counsel churches, people, friends, pastors. We counsel our church. Get the key. Get a hold of the key that God has for you to unlock the, the place where he has sent you, the people, to be able to reach the community that you serve. And I reminded Pastor Paul that from the beginning, when we hit the ground running, we drove from Florida where we got married all the way to California. And on our honeymoon, God gave us a vision for the motel that AJ's parents came to and gave their hearts to the Lord. That AJ and his sister, where they gave their hearts to the Lord, where God poured things into you at that altar that he has never turned you loose from. Never lets you go. No matter where we go, he never lets us go. In our ministry in Missouri, began in our house. Pastor Paul told us last week about asking two neighborhood drug addicts to pray for him. And out of that ministry was born a ministry so big we had to move it to a warehouse and then turn it over to another church when we left Missouri. Our ministry in Lucerne began at a recovery meeting. And in our men's meeting Friday night, a man gave his heart to the Lord. God has given us the key. But we had a man named Craig in our ministry in Lake County. Like I said, he was the first to come forward. He gave his testimony in the park. We would do outreaches in the park. And several men, in fact, at the first one, a 70-year-old man came to the Lord, Robert. I don't know if he's still living because of it. Because they knew the old Craig, and they were moved by the new Craig that they saw. He was a local. His parents owned a cafe on Main Street. It was called Capitan's Cafe. He was the typical high school quarterback who had it all. Until drugs. Until drugs took over his life. And he shared that choice with his wife. Eventually his kids adopted that choice. And his wife was partying and drinking and doing drugs and driving with three friends when a fatal accident occurred. All four people were killed. And Craig had a tremendous amount of guilt that he carried with him. He held himself responsible because he was the one who had introduced them to that lifestyle. Even though his life had been redeemed, guilt and shame plagued him. And so he would come forward and get saved every time we made a call. <laughs> for years, Craig get, kept getting saved, but he also had a huge heart for evangelism. And he wanted to warn everyone about the wages of sin and the flames of hell. And he would get frustrated with us. Because we would tell him, just be a little more sensitive, dial it back a little. He would get in a stranger's face and say, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. And I would suggest he not lead with that line, you know, say hello first or something. <laughs> a tiny little woman wearing an oxygen mask named Christy came forward too. Just few short months before she went to be with Jesus. Craig used to walk through Lucerne carrying a big heavy wooden cross on his shoulder to emphasize the message of repentance 
And I stood at watch over Craig's body when he died, waiting for the coroner to come, knowing Craig wasn't there anymore. Craig was with Jesus. Craig was with Jesus. See, the message of the kingdom that Jesus preached began with an exhortation to repent. And I have to confess that in my effort to be perceived as non-judgmental, loving, and kind, I may have missed an important lesson about the importance of preaching repentance. One of the first people I ever got really direct with was Steve Steinackle. <laughs> and I literally looked in his face and told him, you're going to hell in a handbasket to get his attention. See, only Jesus was able to speak of repentance from the perspective of love, of the King of Kings, against whom all sin is committed. And if that was the message that Jesus preached, that's the message we must learn to preach. With grace, yes, but also with strength and with power. I posted a picture of my father on Facebook. I think I sent it to you guys on our group chat. He would have been 100 years old. And I was thinking that it's not likely that we're going to stand around in heaven, look around and see, oh, who made it and who didn't. I don't think it's going to matter. We're going to be in awe of the one who sits on the throne in the kingdom. Of what he has prepared for us in the kingdom. We can't reach this community by paying, playing psychological games with the lost. Mm -hmm. It must be done with truth, with love, with faith in the message of the kingdom. Don't think you have to walk on eggshells with what the Spirit gives you to say to someone who's lost. Be clear, kind, decisive, even with your family. Yes, we need to be sensitive, but I sometimes wonder if soft-pedaling the message might be exactly what is keeping some from making a decision for Christ. While we're Preaching the kingdom, God is building our future in heaven. In heaven. So, barely scratching the surface today, but it, it just jumped out at me when that pastor said, we preach Jesus, do, but do we preach the message that Jesus preached? And there's so much more, I think, we have to learn and we do have such a loving and gracious God that teaches us, that answers us when we ask. So Father God, I, I bless your name today. Lord, I thank you that you reveal to us, your children, who can be sometimes so foolish, the very wisdom of God that you saw us as your inheritance, as your treasured possession. Father, help us to see each other in the same way. Help us to see with kingdom eyes, Lord. Teach us what we need to know in order to usher in your kingdom, Lord. That moment when the government is restored to your shoulders and the enemy is brought to judgment for all the lies, for all those he has robbed, killed, or destroyed. Lord, we are praying for laborers for this harvest. Yes. We need souls for your hire. And God, we are so grateful Lord, that you contend with us still in your mercy. Bless each one here today, each one. Lord, and Father, speak and we will listen. In Jesus' name.
I pray. Amen. 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 So here we um, we kind of have a time at the. Uh, does that need to be turned off? I think so. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, turn green. Um, it's still recording.